Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Did everyone sleep well? Great. And I trust you had a great day yesterday, because I did. Thank you. And thank you for coming back today. It's, I think we're gonna, going to have another fantastic day. So I just want to thank someone in particular. We'll do some more thank yous later. But since she won't be with us in the evening, I want to thank my colleague, Emily Brown. She's standing over there with the blue. Emily is, is the most organized, detail-oriented, phenomenal person that I work with. This would not happen without her and her vision and her organizational skills, and she's my right hand and my left hand woman. So I want to thank you, Emily, very much. And she has to leave today to go officiate a wedding in Asheville. <laughs> I'd like to introduce someone very special at FHI 360, the Chief Operating Officer, Deborah Kennedy. Deborah Debbie, as we talk, call her, is also, just like Patrick Fine, extremely supportive of gender. A champion and really kind of a cheerleader at FHI 360 and supports the work that, that we do and has gotten right on board with the vision that we've set out for the organization on gender integration and gender mainstreaming. So I'd like to ask Debbie Kennedy to come up and provide some opening remarks. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Andrea always understates her role and in creating these events and proposing them. So I know you won't thank yourself this afternoon. So I, I just want to call out how important and how creative and how, uh, thought, how happy and thankful we are that Andrea is part of FHI 360. Um, so um, welcome. First, let me thank all of you. Um, we were just sharing some thoughts at the table about how somebody declared this conference week in Washington, D.C. I mean, I think of all of the brain power all around. So, and, and all of you have stuck through the week and attended what I think will, be, will go down as one of the most memorable events and most constructive events of the week. So I want to specifically thank all of you, hundreds of development practitioners, gender advisors, monitoring and evaluation specialists, donors, advocates, academics, businesses, youth advocates, and most importantly, our youth ambassadors who have uh, who were here yesterday and who are here today. So thank you. You are what makes this conference. We just facilitate a conversation. Um, yesterday I had the opportunity to participate in many of the events and I thought just briefly I'd talk a bit about some of the highlights, what I took away. So one we learned early in the morning about some key moments of adolescence. You know, and what are some of the critical obstacles that adolescents face and how they're overcoming them. In the Gender Lounge, we received some helpful mind maps and recommendations from dozens of different table topics. And then in the afternoon, we heard from a CSO panel and a US government panel about the design, development, and now unveiling of the US Adolescent Girls Strategy, um, and have had some honest conversations about how to move that forward, how to make sure it survives political transitions and that it becomes a reality in the future. And then at the lastly, we broke into concurrent panels and dug deeper into um, the issue of adolescent focused issues of economic empowerment, sexual and reproductive rights, health education, and LGBTQIA rights. Um, when I think back about yesterday, I was thinking about how 
how right on this conversation is today. And I had a flashback to a conversation. I was in Peru for an, a few years um, working on the U.S. government's foreign aid program. And I was at a girl rising. Peru was one of the ten countries featured in those clips, right? And so we were doing a local unveiling of that clip. And there was a young advocate. She was, I, I'm blanking on her name, but she was from Ukaya, from Ukayali Pukapa, a town. She was about 19, and she was talking about how difficult it was for her to get access to information about reproductive health and how she was consistently turned away from clinic after clinic and said, you're too young, you shouldn't be here, and how the social norms and things just impeded her access. And I think the conversations today just say, this is, this is really a critical issue for the next generation, and the fact that we're talking about adolescent youth empowerment and leadership is so critical. Um, Youth are also calling for an increased role, and it, it's, it's interesting, I was reading, you know, we all Google things, and so I was reading about youth role in addressing development goals, and what came up was a fascinating paper by a young Nigerian about the role of youth in his country, and I, I would encourage you all, but youth really want to be a part about constructing the plan for implementing the sustainable development goals, as well as for tackling the tough problems. After all, when it gets to 2030, many of them are going to be on this stage, not myself and others, and so it's important for them to construct their future. And then we all heard from the U.S. government uh, a challenge, a, a request to all of us to continue to provide support, to echo, to measure progress, to give them feedback on how well the new strategy is evolving. Um, I, had, I took the opportunity to reflect, and a colleague who was sitting at this table earlier, in his comments on the stage yesterday, talked about the importance of research and learning. And so just briefly, and I promise it will be brief, I thought I'd share a little bit about what we at FHI 360 are starting to learn and hope to learn more about. So first is about engagement. And I'll use the example of our project in El Salvador, where we have a USAID-funded education for children and youth. It's led by a local NGO, FEDESAL. And they're working on changing teacher behaviors in the classroom and introducing active learning. And what we're seeing there is when we actively engage youth in the construct of how they talk about, how they explore issues, we get much better results. So it's just a microcosm of how, when you talk to youth and ask them, how can we learn better, how can we get more output, they are very helpful in creating um, solutions to problems that we perhaps don't see. Second point is around the integration of programs. And this is uh, both domestic and international. And in our domestic work, as well as in our international work, um, particularly around orphans and vulnerable children, we're seeing that the siloed, the one-stop project where you go, you go to this project for health, you go to another project for education, it just doesn't work. And we've got to start to add adjacencies or multiple services in terms of addressing the, the needs of youth particularly, but all people, but youth particularly. And we're seeing in, in our education programs in El Salvador that that the integration and these more collaborative spaces are leading to a higher degree of success. The third um, theme that we're looking at in terms of our research and our learnings is around social soundness analysis. And I think all of you know social norms impact how people behave, decisions they make, as well as the power dynamics. And we're using mobile technologies when we're having, when we face some challenges in terms of social norms that might make it inappropriate to share information, we're creating autonomy and supporting individual autonomy of youth through delivery of information and services through mobile technology. And we're doing this in our um, M4 Reproductive Health Project, which provides through SMS-based messaging information about puberty, 
pregnancy and pregnancy prevention, STIs, a lot of different information, and finding that in Tanzania we have 300,000 users and subscribers to this. And I'm sure all of you have great examples of how you're using technology to support um, introduction of information and reaching of youth. Fourthly, we're looking at economic empowerment. We heard from Ambassador Catherine Russell that there'll be another policy paper around economic empowerment. I don't think I need to underscore to all of you just how important it is economic empowerment in terms of opportunity and helping people to create and be responsible for their own future. And then finally, um, as a member of our executive leadership team in FHI 360, we are also looking internally and undertaking efforts to make sure that we're walking the talk. It's not just good to promote gender equality, social inclusion in our projects, we need to promote it in our organization. About a year ago, we adopted a diversity and inclusion strategy. We looked at workplace, workforce in the marketplace, and specifically in the marketplace, how do we help other companies and enterprises engage in development and be part of the solution? And we're looking now further, what other steps do we need to take as the executive team in making sure that we have an organization that's supportive of gender equality and inclusion in all aspects of our work? So, turning to today, what do we want to achieve? We're going to do a deeper dive into the crucial issue of gender-based violence, both prevention and response. We are going to hear much more from our youth voices, and we want to hear from them today much more. What are some of the solutions? And then thirdly, we will be exploring the critical challenge of measurement. And I just came from the Women Deliver conference in Copenhagen where measurement and research was a critical issue. So in setting you up for the day, I would ask or suggest that you think about three things, and I, my, I have short-term memory loss sometimes. So um, I use like shorthand. So I'm gonna talk about learning, listening, and lift as three things that you can think about as you go through the conversation today. First is learning, and this is, what is the key piece of evidence or research that we need to all rally around and that where we really need to learn something and let's try to identify it and see if that might be an opportunity for a collaborative undertaking. Second, listening. What are the biggest internal roadblocks within our institutions or within our projects to really listening and partnering with adolescent youth? And how do we dismantle them? And then thirdly is lift. And I had a hard time finding a word that start with an L. So it's a little bit strange, but lift is about, we often come with a program, and then when we get there, we think about the integrated nature of people's needs, and we need to add something, an adjacency. So the question is, how do we give lift, further lift, greater impact to the programs that we're implementing by adding an adjacency or integrating some additional service? Um, we want to, I want to challenge you also as we go into the day to further reinforce, recommit to what I call creating some artifacts. I would love to create some artifacts that we would, some archaeologists would come 10, 20 years from now and say, they might look at meet the Fockers, right? And you all recall that the, the angst from the father of Ben Falker when he found, or the, the future father-in-law, when he found out that Ben was not a doctor, he was a nurse, right? Aghast. So there was a gender norm there that was done. I heard an NPR story a few days ago about how women, while they're entering STEM careers and particularly engineering, they're dropping out and they're not pursuing these careers. They may even get an engineering degree, but then they drop out because it's so difficult to be the one female voice in five 
a group team of five engineers and they're talking about learning that they're doing about if you create a 50-50 dynamic rather than sprinkle women or sprinkle men, whatever the norm may be, that you can have greater resilience, greater sustainability. And so I want to create artifacts. I want all of us to create artifacts about norms, about beliefs, about things that impede gender equality and ha hope that 20 years from now, somebody comes back and says, boy, that was an artifact, just like eight track tapes, just like discs, you know, re records. We want to create some artifacts around gender norms and things that cause gender inequality. I wish you a great day today. Thank you very much, Debbie. I wanted to say something about when we were designing with our partners the idea for these two days. We, the themes that we had developed were about gender equality and gender-based violence. And of course, you know that we're focusing on adolescent girls and boys. And so today you'll see that many of our panels and discussions will focus on issues around gender-based violence, violence against women and girls. A couple of months ago, Ambassador Natasha Stott Despoja from Australia, she's the ambassador for women and girls issues, she's Ambassador Catherine Russell's counterpart, was here in Washington giving a talk at the embassy about the investments that the Australian government has made to addressing the issues of violence against women and girls in Australia, but also in their aid programs that are primarily focused on the Asian and Pacific regions. And I went up to her and, and told her about our conference and mentioned that DFAT, uh, the Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, actually funds FHI 360 in Papua New Guinea uh, to work on addressing violence against women and girls and strengthening support services for them. And I thought she was going to say, that's nice, okay, bye. But in fact, she was such a lovely woman. She listened, she wanted to know more about the program, and I asked her and invited her to speak today at our gender summit. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make the trip back to Washington, uh, but she put me in touch with Lauren Roche, who is the gender policy advisor at the uh, Australian Embassy in Washington. And we, and Lauren, I'm going to ask you to come up uh, in a moment to introduce uh, the video remarks for that Natasha, Ambassador Natasha Despoja has created for us today. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, thank the Australian government for, for engaging with me and, uh, and offering to have Ambassador Despoja actually create remarks uh, that recognize this summit and the, what the work that we're doing. So, Lauren, would you mind? Ah, thank you, Andrea, and good morning, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be here today as a representative of the Australian Government. I would like to thank FHI, sorry, FHI 360, its organisers and its partners for the opportunity to participate in gender, the Gender 360 Summit this year. I am pleased to introduce to you a message from Australia's Ambassador for Women and Girls, um, Natasha stott -Despoia. Ambassador Stott Despoja was appointed in December 2013 and is Australia's second such ambassador. And she is one of only a handful of uh, ambassadors at this level in the world, including uh, the United States with Ambassador Kathy Russell. I've actually long been an admirer and a supporter of the work of Ambassador Stott Despoja, and I am proud to be part of Australia's work and messaging uh, on the important role that girls, and particularly adolescent girls, play in the future of our bright world. Ambassador Stott Despoja has three key pillars of work, excuse me, of work. Women's leadership, women's economic empowerment, and the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls. 
Uh, this was reflected in Australia's and is part of Australia's priorities, um, as outlined in our gender equality strategy for women's empowerment, which was launched earlier this year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a message from Australia's Ambassador for Women and Girls, Natasha Stott Despoja. Hi, I'm Natasha Stott Despoja, Australia's Ambassador for Women and Girls and Chair of Our Watch, Australia's Foundation for the Prevention of Violence Against Women and Their Children. I commend FHI 360 on its important work and for organising this Gender Summit. Australia is pleased to partner with FHI 360 in programs like Community Look Out and Mary in Papua New Guinea, working with local communities to address violence against women and girls. Despite the best efforts of many people, women in particular, over many decades, violence against women persists as one of the world's most heinous and prevalent human rights abuses. In Australia and across the Indo-Pacific, violence against women is endemic. Momentum to address this has been building in Australia and our region. International evidence about the key drivers of violence against women shows that preventing this violence is connected to gender equality. So, we must address the norms and behaviours that support rigid gender roles and gender stereotyping. Among young people, these pervasive stereotypes lead to the acceptance of violent behaviour in relationships. In fact, according to an Australian survey of national community attitudes towards violence against women, released in 2014, people aged 16 to 24 have a lower level of understanding of violence against women and are more likely to excuse it. Although young people are more supportive of equality in some areas, uh, for example, they support women's right to education, they're also more likely to endorse men dominating decision making in relationships. This is a significant cause for concern, but on the positive side, we do know that violence against women is preventable. So primary prevention activities have got to be a priority. In November last year, Australia launched Change the Story a shared framework for the primary prevention of violence against women and their children. Change the Story is an integrated, long-term national approach to cultural change for the prevention of violence against women. We believe it's a world first in primary prevention and we're encouraging all governments to adopt a framework for the prevention of violence against women. Promoting women's independence and challenging gender stereotypes, that's an essential part of this framework. And we do this through partnerships, in education, workplaces and with sporting organisations. I've seen the effect of domestic, family and sexual violence in Australia and in our region. In Papua New Guinea, for example, rates of violence against women are as high as 90%. The Pacific region is a particular priority for Australia, not just because it's a place where Australia feels it can be most effective, but because with particularly high levels of gendered violence, it's also a place where we need to be effective. In 2012, Australia launched its $320 million 10-year Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development Initiative. This initiative is supporting programs to prevent violence against women and support survivors. It is ensuring more women have access to support services, increasing women's access to legal protection and working with countries at the policy level to implement effective legal frameworks that protect women experiencing violence. In addition, it works with boys, men and traditional leaders to address gender inequality in communities. Engagement with men, particularly those in positions of power and influence, is essential. In Solomon Islands, for example, under the Pacific Women Initiative, the Channels of Hope for Gender program is working with community faith-based leaders to encourage new positive attitudes regarding the roles of women and men. We're supporting male advocacy programs run by the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre and the Vanuatu Women's Centre. These programs engage men as advocates for gender equality and the elimination of violence against women. And in Papua New Guinea, we're partnering to change gendered stereotypes in early childhood through programs like League Belong Life, a school rugby program which teaches healthy, respectful relationships through sport. I know, I've seen it and played it. Resourcing and political will to address the issue of violence against women and girls fluctuate. Informed and appropriate media attention isn't guaranteed. The sheer magnitude and complexity of the issue can be daunting. However, while we refer to gender-based violence as a pandemic, it's not like an illness. Perpetrators choose to commit violence and equally can choose to stop these acts. 
violence is not inevitable. I wish you well for the FHI 360 Gender Summit and I look forward to hearing the outcomes of your discussions.